Talk Line with Zev Brenner, America's premier Jewish broadcast on the air since 1981. And now, here's your host. Welcome back to the program, Mom Zev Brenner. It's been quite a while. I think we broke the story, as I said at the onset, about ooh, about almost a year ago. Well, Aliyah Hawila is our guest. Uh, he we labeled him as the Lebanese Hassan when he first appeared on the broadcast. It turned out that he had married a Syrian young woman from the Jewish community. Then after the wedding was discovered that he wasn't Jewish, they separated. Then it was discovered that he was Jewish. We'll be joined in a few minutes Rabbi Avraham Reich. He is the rabbi who did a lot of the work and, and, and determined that Leah is Jewish. He went through a conversion nevertheless, but we call it conversion l'chumr, just to be on the safe side. Went to Israel, his wife, and was determined that he was married, went to Israel. They tried working it out, just recently gave his wife a get a Jewish divorce. Aliyah, welcome to the program. Welcome back. Thank you, Zev. Thank you, Zev. Did I sum it up correctly? Yes, you did sum it up correctly. I'm just uh, like to correct something a little bit in the title, Lebanese Hassan. I would I would more more say of like uh, Syrian Lebanese Hassan, considering the discoveries we made about my family and uh, my heritage and stuff like that. Right, so, but 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 initially you were um, yeah initially yeah to know you were Jewish right yeah yeah initially 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 I mean initially nothing was confirmed I would say but what, what I'm sorry what did you say what happened no I'm just saying initially nothing was confirmed so nothing could have been spoken a, a lot of people have asked me when you and just to give a little more meat to the story. Mm -hmm weren't Jewish, you said you were Jewish, you learned from Chabad, you put in a yarmulke, you went through the whole, the ritual of I mean, I mean, I mean, here's the thing, here's here's what Rabbi, what Rabbi Abraham Reich spoke about in the last week, said, yeah, this is how the right guidance. To me, and this is, you know, this is something, uh, I think it's fair, you know, I mean, at that point, when everything broke in the news, I could not have had the chutzpah to say I do have any Jewish ancestry or anything when I didn't have any proof. At that point, I wasn't even betting anything on finding any proof or finding anything about my family saying that I am actually born Jewish. So I was just, you know, hoping to do a, a regular cure and uh, to continue my life from that point on. But no, we made discoveries along the way and then. Uh, then it was the, the right time to come out and talk. No, but you and I had spoken. You weren't sure you were Jewish. Maybe you yes, thought. Yes, yeah, I wasn't sure. I, 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 wasn't, I, wasn't, I wasn't fully sure. I wasn't. Yeah. Right. So uh, so uh, at what point did you discover, and I know we'll get here from Rabbi Rach in a few moments, that you, what point did you discover that you actually were Jewish? At what moment did that come as a revelation? I would say, I, I, would, I would more like say, at what point did I find proof? Because... Um, a lot of people encouraged me. They said, okay, fine. So speak to your mother, have your mother, you know, uh, have your mother and grandmother dig into family records, dig into things, you know, just, uh, find some proof. Um, if I even did a mitochondrial DNA test, you know what, my, how mitochondrial DNA works. It only passes down from mother to child. Um, so my mother gave it to me. I can't pass it down to my kids because I'm a guy. If I had a sister, she would pass it down. So my mom got it from her mom, and her mom got it from her mom, etc. It goes through direct maternal line, and those direct maternal lines determine your maternal descent. So the DNA test that I took, the mater mitochondrial DNA test, says that I come from direct uh, direct maternal descent. So there was that. And number two, it's my uh, I don't know, I think you called it Sora. It's it's from my mom and from my grandmother. Well, my grandmother called me and told me no. We're Jewish. We are Jewish. But growing up, did you have any inkling that you were Jewish? There was no mention of a, a gro growing a growing up. I mean, uh, it was. I told you, like, I grew up. I grew up in a in a community that was a mix of Muslims and Christians, mostly Muslim, uh, in South Lebanon. Uh, my parents, my dad, I, as I said before, he used to like pray and fast just for the purpose of doing it. But my mom was not religious. My mom was completely secular. So. Being exposed to religion, I wouldn't say I was very exposed to, exposed to religion in general when I was younger. So. Okay, so you weren't exposed to religion, but here what happened was, and this is what makes the story intriguing and complicated, mm -hmm. that you masqueraded as somebody who was Jewish, 
You got mm -hmm. married, and then when after the wedding, when uh, your wife's family discovered online that you weren't Jewish, that's when all hell broke loose. And it, it, it wasn't more of like a discovery online. It was my ex-wife's father uh, reached out to my father, and you know, I don't know what conversations happened between them. But then my ex-wife's father sent a voice note to the entire Syrian Kila saying, "My save my daughter. She's living with a terrorist." This is how the whole thing blew out of out of proportion. And the FBI investigator spoke to the New York Police Department. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, 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 I, I'm not going to say the name of the detective, but if anyone wants to communicate with him and speak with him, they came to the house. They were very nice to me. You know. Um. Yeah, they investigated everything upside down. Right. So here you are. You're married. You were you were separated. You're because they found out what they determined that you weren't Jewish. You found that you were Jewish. So what happened? At, let's pick up the narrative, and then we'll speak to Rabbi Reich, who's joined us as well. So let's pick up the narrative. So what happened? After you discovered you're Jewish, you spoke to Rabbi Avram Reich. You went through a conversion, the Chumr, which means you went through conversion, though you didn't have to, because the determination is if uh, if more than two generations, I believe it's three generations, mm -hmm. practice Judaism, even though you are Jewish, but you have to go through this perfunctory uh, conversion. So... What happened? Did your marriage get back on track at that point in time? What transpired? Um, not necessarily. Not necessarily. I mean, I, you know, I think I can talk about it now. But um, since the moment me and my wife got separated, like physically separated, I, I left the, the Kahila in Brooklyn. Um, we stayed in touch. We actually stayed in touch. We were calling. And I, I think you yourself know about this. Because you've I been in touch that. with both me and her. Uh, we and me and her were in touch with each other. We were talking. Uh, no, cut off a lot. Cut, cut. Go ahead, uh, Rabbi. We'll get you in just a moment. Go ahead, uh, Ilya. No, I just think they they need to mute. <laughs> they need to mute the microphone. Right. Um, get the better picture, uh, Rabbi. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Please. Yes. So we we stayed in touch. We you know she said you know I want you to, this is before we found out that I'm actually uh, she said you know I want you to do conversion. I want to do you know, want to you know, be together again, we get remarried after the conversion, stuff like that. Um, and then the time came where she went on a trip. I'm not going to touch down, touch base on what type of trip it was, because she was gone for like three months. And during that time, that's the time when we launched this whole investigation and found out about my ancestry and about that I'm actually born Jewish. And then Rabbi Abraham Reich went on the interview. Um, so we started being in touch again me and my ex-wife, and um, we went, you know, I didn't have plans for Pesach, she didn't have plans for Pesach, so we sort of like both of us ended in Israel for Pesach. Um, my plan was to, my plan was to actually just be there for Pesach, but I ended up, I said, Israel is so beautiful, I, I can't go back to America. Even right now, I'm making Aliyah. Uh, I'm in the process of making Aliyah. So we ended up, and we ended up in Israel. Um, it was very, it was, at the beginning, it was a very, very rough time. Um, I mean, I would say a very rough time in terms of my marriage itself, because there, it was the ind indecisiveness, not on my part, but on my ex-wife's part, the indecisiveness. You know? I, mean, I mean, I can't blame her. She was trying to make everyone happy. She was trying to make her parents happy, her friends happy, you know, pressure from everyone, from community, from friends, from things like that. Um, so I was patient with that, you know, Sablanut, as they say, um, my, my rabbi in Israel, uh, the Yanuka, he said, take everything with Sablanut. So I took everything with Sablanut. Um, it was, I'm, I'm, it was a hard time because, you know, like I was trying to rebuild my life. With her. I was trying to move in with her. I was trying to, you know, just get things, get things all back together. And she was getting threats from her family, you know, if we, you go back with him we're gonna disown you we, we don't want to have want to have anything to do with you um number one number two even people from Yad Lachim were still getting involved for no reason even and even herself herself she used to tell me you know I don't I don't want to lose support from Yad Lachim I don't want to lose support from this rabbi I don't want to lose my friends my friends well, tell me I'm crazy context. if I go back with you let me throw a little context that in the Syrian Jewish community mm -hmm. now had you been a regular convert, you would not have been accepted. There is a edict going back 40, 50 years or longer in this yeah, yeah. where they will not accept converts under any circumstances. So since they determined, even if they you would have been a convert, 
they wouldn't accept you. Now, I don't believe they accepted the ruling from Rabbi Avram Reich and others that determined that you were Jewish. No, I mean, I, 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 I cannot speak for the entirety of the Syrian community. Um, but there was a ruling from the rabbin itself that this boy is Jewish and his marriage is, is legit. And if they if if he or she need need to marry someone else, he has to give her a gift. Um, I can't speak for the entirety of the Syrian community, but there's one rabbi in the Syrian community. He's not per se Syrian. He's Yemenite. Um, but he has so much power in the Syrian community and he still went against the decisions of the rabbin and said, no, she doesn't need a get. She doesn't need a get. Fine. Whatever you want to say, say. You know. Uh, it's not going to change the ruling of the chief rabbis of Israel, you know. Now, the um, chief rabbi of Israel determined that you have to, that when things didn't, were jumping the gun a little bit, you try to, both you and your ex-wife try to salvage the marriage at some point being in Israel. From what I Yeah, understand. yeah, yeah. We went to the Rabbanut and the Rabbanut Paskin, the same exact thing that Rabbi Abraham Reich and uh, the Beit Din that did my girl, the Humra. They passed in the same thing. They said there's a suffolk, and if she needs, if she needs, uh, you know, she needs to marry someone else, or if he needs to marry someone else, he has to give her the chumra. That's the halacha. That's as it is. Rabbi, let me turn to Rabbi Avram Reich. Uh, thank you for joining us, Rabbi Reich. Yes, Ashwato. If I can just, if you can just lift your mic, your your camera a little bit, so we can see more of of, of your face. Perfect, perfect. Okay. So I, I'm sure you've been listening to what Ali has been saying. So you. Did the research and you discovered that he was indeed Jewish, even though the world said he wasn't Jewish. You did the homework, correct? Well, uh, I tried to do whatever I can. You know, I, we're we're doing conversion already for over forty years. So over forty years, uh, for over forty years, we're doing uh, we're doing conversions, and you get to know the knack of what are you, who's a yid and who's not a yid. And there's certain ways of determining that the person that you know you're investigating is a yid or not a yid, and uh, and everything came down to the point that he is a yid. According to the Torah, he has a chazaka being a yid, and uh, the head rabbi of Israel, uh, Rabbi Yosef, came him him with his bezin came to the same conclusion. As I did, and I imagine they did it the same way I did. Were they called? Uh, I read in the papers. Didn't they call uh, Aliyah's grandmother in Lebanon? Right, right, right. But you know, uh, you can't say it because they spoke to her on the phone that they that uh, decided that he's a Jew. It's it's much more than that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's much, much more than that. You have there are all different types of angles you look at. One of the things they did, of course, was to to, to speak to his grandmother. Uh, I think maybe to, uh, you know to his mother, and um, that was just that was just part. Uh, that was just part of the um, of the puzzle of uh, uh, saying. Uh, uh, did, did they rely on your ruling because you did all this work before? And <laughs> so well, I'll, uh, well, 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 I'll tell you. I'll tell you. I'll tell you the truth. The Bezdin um, in New York, which is one of the top Choshevet Bezdins in New York, uh, they know me for many many years. And I told him, listen, this uh, this Elia Chavila uh, participated in my shiurim. He came da davening him and his wife. And you know, when I when I give shiurim, I can tell where, when the Torah goes into the person's heart or not. And he was always attentive, daven very very erlich. I was very impressed with him. So when when I heard this whole balagan that he's not a Jew, I said it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. And uh, so we started uh, investigating. And there's certain ways you investigate to find out whether, you know, whether it's a yid, it's, it's Messiah Lefi Tumoy, asking certain questions which have nothing to do with, with conversion. It's, it's, a, it's a whole process. Um, it's, it's, this cannot be explained to a layman. It's only uh, to Rabbanim that have, that have experience in Geiris. So this, therefore, the, when I came to make this Geiris L'Chumrah, uh, uh, this Bezdin uh, is uh, affiliated with Rabbanut, and it's very, very hard for them to to make Geiris. They have a chosh of the Bezdin. They really have to be proved. They have to be proven that the person that is asking to be misguided is really sincere. And when I told them, he's in my kehilla, and I know him, and he's a he's he's mitzvahs. 
and he has the, all the midas of a year. He's about chesed. He's a wonderful, wonderful person. They accepted it on, 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 on what I said, and they made the gear l'chumah. They made the gear l'chumah just sim simply because uh, they wanted to help him, you know, um, help him in this, you know, with, with all the balagan that's going on. Is he a Jew? He's not a Jew. So this, this making this gear l'chumah would would end all of this, all of the gossip. He's is he, is he, he's not a yid. But that didn't mean that he was not a yid. It was made great l'chum like you like you had said before. When there's a certain amount of generations where there is no Yiddish guide in a family. The Paiskim felt that we should make a gear um, So uh, maybe Hashem, maybe Hashem gave me siyata dishmaya. Now because now because this bezin over here in America was mashim, and they told Reb Bezdin and their Rabbi Rashi, uh, the Rosh Bezdin, I spoke to the uh, Rabbi Rashi and told him that I know Rabbi Reich for so many years, and he has Mesir Snafish for for the Gairim. And his whole life is dedicated for Gerim. And if he tells me he's a Shemitah and Mitzvah, and he, I, I accepted it at face value. And I imagine that also had um, um, had also uh, an effect on the Rabbanut. And, and the fact that I was the one who started it and, and I have experience in it. And I have other, I have other cases in the Rabbanut also where they've seen that uh, we do the we do the garis for uh, mitzvah. We do not take. I just want to say we do not take any money for garis because it says in Shulchan Aruch you're not supposed to. And even those that do take, I just want to clarify. There's a cloud of of um, um, this, um, the person uh, loses his uh, loses a time, right? If you lose time, you you have to you have to pay the guy dying for the time for the time that he lost. Just like a, a, a rabbi is supposed to teach for bechinon, not, not take any money, but because he's um, it's, it's called schar batala, it's hard that a person uh, does not do anything. Automatically, he has to do this mitzvah that we're giving him. Yeah. So uh, I, 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 I would I would say that Baruch Hashem, I had this chus uh, to start um, start getting the truth out and. Um, did you and try communicating this with the Rabbi Rach? Did you try communicating this with the Syrian rabbin with the Syrian rabbis? Yes, I yes I did. And um, did they accept your ruling? Did they accept? They they, they, ref, they refused to answer my calls because I imagine they knew what I was going to say, and they were against it. Uh, they were against it. But I can tell you something very interesting. That one of the mothers of the rabbinim in the Syrian community called me, and she told me Rabbi Reich. I know Elia for many years. I wish the boys in the Syrian community would be as serious with with davening and learning and doing mitzvahs as Elias. <laughs> so uh, it was nice. It was nice to get such a you know from one of the uh, one of the big rabbis uh, over there. The, you know, I, I don't want to speak against the Kehillah, but you know, it, we're, we're, we're coming to Mashiach's times now, and there's so many gerim, true gerim that we have to be Megayer. How can we put it just a, law, a rule in a law that we can't? Uh, uh, That's a whole separate discussion again. where, you know, Elias' case is unique because he's not really a convert because he discovered yeah. he's Jewish. So yeah. if that indeed is the case, the rule of the Syrian Jewish community would right. not Wouldn't apply. Yeah. Right? Well, I, you know, you know, you know, Zev, there's the, there's, there's the, um, it says in Shpil and Perak Shishi. There are 48 things, 48 tanoim to Kabbalah Satoira. Right? One of the last uh, last tanoim, um, uh, one of the last uh, uh, of the 48 tanoim to Kabbalah Satoira is to, to, uh, to be moida al ha MS. In other words, you made, you, made it, you made a mistake. <laughs> you can have all the other great milers of learning tire and milers bit tire and giving tzedak and everything. But when it comes to be lemis, sometimes it's hard to uh, to be it, uh, so, the, the Syrian community is a wonderful community. They really care. They're growing for, and they really, really care. They, they had to, uh, they had a special goal in mind. But the question mm -hmm. though is, should it rule be absolute? 
because Gerimer and converts are such an important part of our religion. Uh, Zev, let, Zev let, me, let me explain to you, if, you know, and I want everybody to hear this. It's very easy to make a rule, we don't want any Gerimer, very easy. So for instance, what do I do when somebody comes to me and wants to become a, uh, wants to become a Gerimer, a woman has a Gerimer, the first thing I do, I have to determine whether this person is serious or not. So the first thing you do is they have to join a kehila, which has a rub in it, which has a rub in it, which has shurim in it, that is, is ready to accept this person as a ger to teach him what's necessary. In if after a year of staying in the kehila, that's davening three times a day, putting on tefillin, well Shabbos is something you, know, you have to you have to one 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 uh, laugh one practice of Shabbos that you're not allowed to keep. But if after a year, they call, I speak to the Rav, and the Rav tell me this person is serious. This person comes to Daven three times a day. He comes to Shi'urim. He's learning. He knows the Lama Tess Molochis. Why shouldn't I be Megayim? Why? You know, you know why it was made that they made this law? Because there was nobody there to, inv to, to invest time in a, a person that came with a, with a girl, with a, with, a, with a guy, with a guy. So the, the, the normal thing would have been to say is, is she, is she really want to become a Jew? Okay, we'll send her to a Kehila for a year and see. That's, that's when you see whether it's true or not. The proof is just, to the say, ju just to say, no Gerim, you, know, it, it, you have to do your homework. You, know, you have to do your homework, you know? And I, want to, I want to tell you, I want to tell you something, Zev. Yeah. I want to tell you something, Zev. And everybody should hear this. That because the Syrian community, uh, which is a wonderful community, and I love them, I have a lot of good friends there, and they're great, but because they're still keeping this rule of not accepting Gairim, it has an effect all over the world. For instance, in Mexico, a Gair cannot go into a normal shul in Davin. Would you believe that? A Gair that's Shashoy Mitzvah. And, you know, I'm dealing with this on a daily basis, you know, people call me and they're, and uh, South America is producing many, many gay rooms. And uh, gay, the, uh, the ones that we did, all of them told us, I asked them, why do you want to become a gay? You know, so pe many people say reasons because, you know, I hate Christianity, I love the Jewish uh, davening. They all said one thing, they investigated in their lineage and they saw they come from Eden. They came from Eden, there are many, because when in the Inquisition and other times when, the, when they ran away, only many of them ran to South America, to, to Mexico, to Venezuela, all around. So, so you know, so now it's what's what's a terrible thing in Mexico, which is a Baruch Hashem, a very beautiful Kehillah, a ger is not allowed as a minion. No, in that's, that's, that, that's, that's terrible. A whole separate conversation. Speaking as Rabbi Abraham, he's involved in conversions as you hear, and we're continuing. We're going to hear from Ali Hawila. He is the Lebanese Hassan and. I determined he wasn't Jewish after he married his children Jewish brother. He, as you heard, Rabbi Rock said he was Jewish. They and the, he and his wife try to reconcile in Israel. I, I, I want, I want to, I want to inject one thing, uh, uh, Zev. Yes. One thing, Zev. You know that Eli is not not saying it, so I'll have to say it. His mother told me in history. He told me from when he was ten years old, he would never, never go to a mosque. His father went to the Shlepin, never would go. He always was close. To be to, to, to Judaism, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's not that all of a sudden he all of a sudden he fooled the girl, and, uh, and and now he found out he he always he always felt he was Yiddish because he he really was Yiddish, you know. Anyway, I wanted to inject that that it's not just. But, 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 but he listened. He did go through uh, where he, he he himself wasn't sure he was Jewish until you determined that, and mm -hmm. that created the in the marriage where they were separated when he was on this right. program right. Right. through right. all he, his mass grade is being right. Jewish and right. he explained right. it but we're going to pick up our conversation Leo. But, but don't, don't forget he, don't forget he, he, he there's, a, there's, a, there's a difference what is the ruts and the will of a person he never, he never did it because he wanted to fool somebody he didn't he didn't do all this because he wanted to fool he did it because he wanted to be an al -Khiyid. But at the, same time, at the same time, his wife was hurt, Barb. We'll talk about that. That's we have right, to be right, right, right. that affects the the point. to this day. Um, so we'll we'll, we'll yeah. continue our conversation with Aliyah Hawila. He's the Lebanese Hassan. Rabbi Abram Reich is the rabbi who helped him find his Judaism. We'll be back right after these messages. Some bureau.
listening uh-huh. to Talk Line with Zev Brenner, America's premier Jewish broadcast on the air since 1981. And now, here's your host. And we're back. Aliyah Hawila is our guest. So we call him the Lebanese Hassan. Uh, he determined he, when he first went out and got married, he wasn't really Jewish. He didn't know he was Jewish. And then uh, afterwards, he separated from his wife. He was determined he was Jewish. They both tried to reconcile in Israel. He's currently divorced. Rabbi Avram Reich is his rabbi who helped determine his Jewishness and has been guiding him. Well, let me turn to you. So here you are. You're in Israel. Okay. Uh, you were, this was before you found out that you were Jewish. So what happened then? You, I, I, at some point, you determined you were Jewish. You went through the conversion. You tried to get that, together. That was, that was before I got there. That was before you got there. So when you got to yeah. Israel, you were Jewish. I remember you were there. Uh, your wife, who, who Rabbi Rock determined you were married, went there. You tried to work things out. So prepared. We tried to work things out. We took it to the Rabbanut. And as I said, the Rabbanut passed in the same thing that Rabbi Reich, the best in America, passed. Same exact thing. And one rabbi in the Syrian community, not even Syrian, Yemenite, he re- re- rebelled against the decision of the Rabbanut. But again, you know, people can say whatever they want. But well, some of my listeners have said to me, they said, listen, your marriage was based on on deception because she thought you were Jewish originally at that moment in time. Mm-hmm. You didn't realize. So it's very hard to get back on track when you have a foundation that was faulty because it was based on a premise that you were Jewish when you didn't know you were Jewish at that time. And that created all the tensions that you had. Um, I wouldn't I wouldn't say it was I wasn't I wouldn't say because of that. It was I mean, I told you we stayed in touch even after they separated us physically. We were we were calling each other and texting each other every day. And she said, I love you and I want you and I want us to be together. And her family was just threatening her. You're shaming our name in the community. You're causing, you're embarrassing us, this and that. So when we went to Israel, the pressure, you know, we were expecting that the pressure in Israel is going to go down, but it only went up. You know, but So there was pressure from her family, pressure from friends, pressure from, you know, even people in Yad Lachim. Like I don't, I don't even know why Yad Lachim was still involved. You know, Yad Lachim should be there to, you know, if a girl is married to an Arab and stuck in an, in an Arab village, they save her. That's fine. We need that, you know. Um, but you know that wasn't the that wasn't the case. So we were we were trying to work it out. You know, we were going on vacations. To, not I wouldn't say going on going on vacations, but we spent Shabbatot together, me and her. You know. Um, we got invited to families, to spend time together, to hang out. We weren't living together, of course. Um, and we tried to work it out. It was, you know, she, she was trying to play safe with both sides. She doesn't want to lose her family. She doesn't want to lose her friends. So she tells her friends, you know, I don't want him. I hate him. I don't want to be with him. And then she tells me, you know, I love you and I want you. So just, you know, at, at some point, like, you can't blame her. Like, you can't, she's she's scared to lose her friend. Uh, Zev, are you talking? I can't hear you. Yeah, go ahead. I'm listening to you. Yeah. So she she doesn't want to lose her friends. She doesn't want to lose her family. So I was I took it with Sablanut and I was very patient. And um, but it reached a point where I just couldn't take it anymore. You know, we have we have to make you have to make a decision. You have to make up your mind. Are we a couple? Are we gonna be together? Um it, but it kept going on and on and on. And then we had a marriage therapist. We went to a marriage therapist um in Yerushalayim. And uh, during that time when we were working with the marriage therapist, even the marriage therapist didn't help, you know, because she was getting, she was still getting so much pressure. And I was even getting threatened with violence, you know, um, at some point, I don't even know if it was family members from her side or someone, but I was getting emails, people threatening me with violence. If you don't leave her, if you don't uh, get off of her, we're going to come do this. I, I didn't take it into any consideration. You know? You know, it's, it's there's an there's an Arabic saying. I don't. I'm not gonna say the translation, but you know, I'm sure people in the Syrian community will understand. It's like drat ablat, which means like it's uh, it's just talk in the air. You know, I I knew it didn't mean anything. So let's, but, let's, let's let's squeeze in some funk. Where a lot of people went to speak. Let's go to Yaakov and Midwood. Go ahead, Yaakov. You have a question. Oh. Thank you. Uh, I have a few a very quick pertinent questions. Number one, and this is pertinent. Uh, how come you have an American English if you grew up in a in a refugee camp in Lebanon? How, how come you speak like an American? Who, That's number one. Who said he was in a refugee camp? Where, refugee, a, what, what, where, where do you get this from? I got it from the newspaper that when the when the scandal broke out, excuse me, it said that you grew up in a refugee camp in southern Lebanon. 
Is no, that... I didn't grow up in a I didn't grow up in a refugee camp. I grew up in the city of Tyre in the city of Sor, South Lebanon. It wasn't okay. a refugee camp. It was it was very close okay. to the beach in a, in a nice area in in Tyre, Lebanon. We were and not a refugee. Got it. Your family was middle class. You're thinking Palestinian. He's not Palestinian. I'm not Palestinian. Right, exactly. That's the whole point. So the, the the papers lied. It was fake news. That I read that. Yeah. Time. I didn't make it up. Okay, fine. I'm glad to hear that. But how do you have such an American English anyway? No, I, I grew up learning English, actually. The, the school that I went to taught went English. In. Okay, now let me ask you a question. Why did you feel you had to masquerade? Why did you go through what you thought you're not Jewish? Why didn't you go through a real gay with if you thought you're not a Jew? Why did you have to fake? I mean, if you go back to the previous interview with Zev and everything I said on the news, I tried to do a conversion turned down in Texas well, I, a few times well, and then I, I think you, you went first to a reform rabbi if I remember yes yes and they turned me down and I at that point you know again the ideas of a 17 year old boy was very attached to Judaism and I was scared of getting rejected so I just sort of like went along with it and I said well it's Jewish all right but you went you in the end you you portrayed yourself as an orthodox Jew why didn't you go to an orthodox rabbi Again, I was 17 years old. So my, again, my, it, it's the information and the guidance that what, you know, what information and, guide, and guidance can a 17 year old get just arriving from Lebanon? Okay, all right, you were 17. I, I got you. You're 17 going on 18, like the song says. But anyway, be that as it may, uh, what drew you, uh, very quickly, what drew you towards Judaism since you didn't know you were Jewish? What drew you in that direction? No, I mean, uh, the love of discovery, number one, number two, you know, at the, at, you know, it's, it's just something that you feel in your heart. You know what I'm saying? I, you know, reading, reading the Tanakh, reading the Torah first time, it's like you feel like you're part of it. You know, it's, it's, it's not, it's, 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 it's on a case, it, to every single person, it, uh, it's different. But for me, you know, my attachment to Torah, you know, I read the Tanakh by myself when I was in, still in Lebanon. I downloaded it from the internet. It's not, didn't it's. You think, didn't you think you're a Christian? How did you? No, no, no. Christianity never made sense. Christianity never made sense to me. Christianity never made sense, and no, no, not at all, not at all. Okay, so, okay, you said, last question. so why did your mother? Why did your mother and your your grandmother was still alive? Why did they keep from you their Jewish background? I'm sorry. Why? When the why question, did your? Yeah, go ahead. Why did your mother and grandmother keep your Jewish background from you? That's the question. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not it's not something people in South Lebanon talk about, especially because, you know, even in the, in the Southern Lebanese community, it's extremely anti-Semitic. So it's not something that people talk about. And it's not something that, you okay, know, affects their daily right. life. How about your father? Was he Jewish? No, 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 not at all. Did your father know that his wife, your mother, is a Jew? Did he know no, that? No, not at all. Uh huh. Okay, so that that. But they're, but, they're not, but your parents are not together, or are they? Right. No, no, no. My parents have been separated since 2019. Okay. So the, the, okay. How, how, Jack, thank you for your question. How did your father react to the fact that you that he discovered his wife was Jewish and that uh, you? I don't know. I'm 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 not in touch with him. I have, I have not been in touch with him since 2019. Decided Here's to give up on his family and leave. So. Martin writes, and this is for Rabbi Reich. What role did the DNA test and play in determining Aliyah's Jewishness? Did the Israeli rabbinate consider that at all? Could you clarify the role of those tests? Also, do you think there is a danger of Judaism turning to eugenics because of the focus on DNA and bloodlines? Rabbi Reich. Yeah. <clears throat> well, I can only say what the post can say. Um, the most the DNA can help you with is uh, guiding you in a certain direction. That, you know, you see a DNA of, uh, of a person that has the genes of a Jew, doesn't mean necessarily mean that he is a Jew, but it, it, it guides you that, listen, hey, we, let's, let's, let's look into this and uh, let's, let's go into, give him the benefit of the doubt now that he wants to become Jewish. And let's, let's really see if he was Jewish or not. And Zev, I want to say something now. Okay, Zev? Go ahead, Rabbi. Okay. I want to say something now. This is not halacha lemaisa. What I'm saying now is not halacha lemaisa. But I'm going to say, I'm going to say, uh, who told me this? And, uh, and I'm saying this now because I want to, I want, I want to, I want to, I want, to, uh, I want people to look at um, uh, Elia in a positive light. 
and not in the light of that he's a you know he's a deceiver and stuff. Uh, Rebbe Feinstein told me that his father, Rabbi Moshe, who was the Paisik Gadar, felt that if a person was brought up by Jews and he acted like a Jew, he did not need conversion. Say it one more time that if somebody... Again, again. Rebbe Ruve Feinstein yes. told me, told me personally, that his father, Rabbi Moshe Feinstein, who was the Paisik Gadar, according to everybody, felt that a child that is brought up, uh, a child from a from a non a Jewish family that's brought up by Jews and acts like a Jew completely, does not need conversion. Has that been accepted by anyone? Has that no, been no, no. But I'm just uh, I, but I'm I'm just telling you that there that there are many buti dinim today that use that as a sniff. Uh, to, to determine that a person is a, is a Jew. Okay, let's take some more phone calls. Let's go. So this, so this, uh, the, reason I, the reason I'm saying this is that is because I want people to, that he felt that he was Jewish, he was acted like a Jew all the way the time. There are, there are Paisen that say that he is a Jew because of that. So he wouldn't need a girl Kachomer then? He wouldn't need I, 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 according to what Rebuvi Feinstein told me from his father, Ramosha Feinstein, he wouldn't need a girl because he acted, he acted like a year for many, many years. His mother told me that even when he was a child, he refused to go to the mosque, and he only wanted to uh, learn and read about Judaism. So he, his, 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 his neshama was in Judaism from the beginning, and he practiced it. He practiced it in every way possible, not only in halachot, in, in midas of yid, of being helpful for whatever he can. So uh, let, let's not attack him of uh, being such a deceiver if according to many Paiskim, he was a Yid before. Okay, let's even, take, even, let's even if his mother was not a Yid. Let's go to George in Manhattan. George, you have a question for our guest. Go ahead, George. I have two questions, but I'll hang up afterwards. Any Louis Gates says he can identify a Jewish gene. I find that preposterous. My question, is Western Judaism a work in progress? What do you mean by that? Well, in other words, it's still cleaning, uh, you know, uh, cleaning off the edges and whatnot. Because, they, because according to books I've read, that when it came to America, especially, there were certain things that sort of uh, were in, added or subtracted that might have been more acceptable outside of the country. Listen, Get every the every every country where people live, Jews are in China or America, wherever they might be, they're going to be certain characteristics of the country they live in that's going to impact, especially if they marry people who are part of the community where they live. I agree. I, I so agree. That's, the second question is, do my East African brothers still have to go through a conversion process? Which East African? Israel. In Israel. Wait, you talking about the, you talking about the Israelites? The uh, Falasha. Oh, the Falasha. I'll let Rarak respond to the fact that... The, the, the fact that the, that's the Ethiopian Jews the Falasha is referring to. Rabbi Rarak. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> all I can all I can say is that one of the greatest people in our generation, the of our generation, um, who had unlimited Abbot Yisrael for every Jew in the world, right? And he was Makar tens, maybe hundreds of thousands of Yidden already with his Abbot Yisrael. It's the Lubavitch Rebbe, Zuchusa Yom Nalainu. He felt it was for their benefit to go through Gavir Slechum. And he didn't do it out of uh, trying to, to belittle them or degrade them. He felt that this was the best thing in, 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 because as they go through life, there'll be people that are questioning. And, uh, and I really can't um, explain the Rebbe's uh, reasoning for this. But if he, if he reasoned this, and he was most probably one of the greatest Torah scholars of our generation, there was nothing that he didn't know, nothing. He was prolific, proliferated in every in every subject, in every Indian, in every mitzvah of of of, uh, of the Jewish nation. And if he said they need a Geris Lachumra, I think we should bow our heads and say, Rebbe, you're right. It was done. Our guest, you just heard Rabbi Avram Reich. He is a prominent conversions and Balchubas in, in New York City. 
He's been guiding our guest, Lee Hawila, the Lebanese chassan, who went through a whole thing where he was determined Jewish and not Jewish. His marriage was, uh, he was married, then he wasn't married. He just went through the world. We'll talk about the divorce proceedings when we come back right after these messages. So don't go away. Stay. You're listening to Talk Line with Zev Brenner, America's premier Jewish broadcast on the air since 1981. And now, here's your host. And we're back. The Lebanese chassan Leah Hawila is our guest. Rabbi Abermeich has helped guide him as far as his finding his Jewish identity, his conversion, the Chumrah, and of course, been guiding him since. Let me turn to Aliyah. So you were, t- Aliyah, are you there? Okay, we'll, we'll get to him in just a moment. And uh, so Rabbi Reich, uh, have you had much difficulty? I'm back. Um, with right. other Rabbanim with your rulings or most of them accept the Assyrian Committee accepted? Just give me a yes or no answer. I was just curious. Yes, yes and no. Okay, you know what? I, uh, Baruch Hashem, uh, they're just compliments. Baruch Hashem. Good to hear that. Let me turn to Ali again. So here you are, you're in Israel, you're trying to work out your marriage, you go to a therapist, and what we went, to, we, we went We went to a marriage therapist. Um, the marriage therapist was just trying to help my, my wife, my, my ex-wife, uh, make a decision. She said, you, know, you can't go tell people, this boy is horrible, this boy tricked me, please help me out and give me support. While at the same time, you know, hanging out with him in secret and just, you know, telling him, that, promising him that you, uh, promising him that you want him and you want to build a life with him and live with him, and it continued like that in a chain of just going back and forth in toxicity and toxicity, and nothing was working out. She was at some point telling me, you know, I'm embarrassed to be seen with you in the streets, and I'm like, you know, it, it, it really hurt. You know, even pe- people people had, you know, I don't know how Shad Khanim and people had the chutzpah in Israel. To approach both me and her and try to suggest other people for us when we were when we were still married it's, it's just it's, it's crazy um but it continued like this and then at some point you know we were we started you know going into fights because i could just couldn't take that anymore you have to make up your mind you have to make a decision things have to move forward and then i lost uh, contact with her for about three weeks she wasn't responding to the phone or anything nothing and then after that i find out um from someone that oh rabbi and a, a big big rabbi from harno uh, found a bait dean in in b'nai brock that that wrote her wrote her a letter finally they found someone who was willing to go against the ruling of the rabbanut and wrote, wrote her a letter saying that oh her marriage is not uh, is just the uh, it's, it's not kosher and she's allowed today. So I found out she was actually going out with someone, you know, dating someone while, you know, this issue with the whole get was not resolved yet. I, I don't and, want to get over there because these are allegations. I, I wanted to stick more to what transpired. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I, I mean, this is something that I discovered. And then she came back and she said, no, I love you. And I, you know, I want to continue our marriage. And people were trying to push me and, you know, stuff to do things and stuff like that. So I said, okay, fine. I love you so much as well. And let's continue our marriage together. Um, so, okay, fine. We were, we were continuing. And this was around early November, I think late October, early November, when we started getting back in touch at this point, I, I was, you know, um, Baruch Hashem working and making Parnassa and everything. And uh, said, yeah, let's, let's, let's work things out together. Let's move in together at the end of December. Live like husband and wife, support me, you know, we live together, we have a family, you know, and we'll we'll figure out a solution for my parents. And I did I did my role and I was supporting her, you know. And okay. then it comes to a point where we where we had a we, where we had a fight mid-December. All of a sudden she just picked up and left. Picked, picked literally legit picked up and left and went to America. And I found out that she's in America and she you know, I tried to fly after her to just, you know, make things up for her, you know, so be like, I love you, let's work things out. And at the airport, they tell me, oh, you can't leave the country. Your wife called and she said that she told the Rabbanu. Well, actually, I think they told me at the airport, they said. Rabbanu, what? You, you, I, from what I read in the papers, they said you were withholding from giving a get to your wife, a religious divorce. No, 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 not, not at all. Not at all. But in December, again, we were supposed to move in together at the end of December. So mid-December, we had this fight. She ended up leaving and going back to America. Um, <laughs> so 
So I tried to fly after her a few days after. And they stopped me at the airport. They said the Beddin Harabani in Tel Aviv is not letting you fly. So I said, you need to go and find out. So I went to the Rabbanut and they said, um, your wife called us and she said she she wants to get a get. She wants to get divorced um, and she wants to go back to her family. Okay, fine. So give me an appointment so that we can resolve. It. So they gave me an appointment for the following day and I went. I get there and then there's like a lawyer from Yad Hayot, who's like, involved in the case i'm like when did all these people get involved like within a few days so we went inside and the judge there asked me you know and the bait dean he said do you want to give her a get i said no rabbi for now um i think my wife is angry just give me you know a little bit of time to try to work things out let me talk to her let me calm her down if things work out they work out if they don't then they don't you know we'll uh, we'll give a get so i i, I told him and say shalom by it so the lawyer screams at me in the courtroom. She says, So the judge was like, calm down. You know, no, he can ask for Shalom Bay. I said, okay, fine. They gave me, they said, you have a little bit of time. It was about a week. I went back home and I, you know, I, I was calling her. I was trying to, to work things out. And um, things did end, ended up not working out. So within a week after she asked for a get, I went back to the Rabbanut. And uh, I gave her a get. But this whole, you know, stuff about, oh, her family filed, uh, proposed a paper that he's not Jewish and he's been withholding a get for you. No, this is, this is not the case. We've been trying to work out our marriage for almost a year already. And uh, we were supposed to move in together at the end of December. But um, it didn't work out. Didn't work out. And yeah. I gave her the get. And, I, and now I'm back, you know, back on track with my life trying to, you know, figure things out. And I, it's a surprising thing. I found out that she uh, she just got engaged to someone from the community here, um, which happened so fast. And uh, I'm trying to pick up my life together now. But, you what know, you but I understand you have a good position in Israel. You're involved politically in Israel as well, from what I, what I hear? I'm in, yes, I am. I am. Um, I mean, I'm, I've been part of, you want to call them riots, you want to call them protests, call them whatever you want, but I've been participating in activities, you know, in, uh, you know, stuff with Otsma Yehudit, stuff with, you know, uh, the rights of, you know, Jews to, you know, to, I mean, I personally don't go on Harabait, but if a Jew wants to go on Harabait, you know, if Itamar Ben-Gvir wants to go there, he has all the right to go. So um, I even met Itamar Ben-Gvir in person, I know him in person. Um, yeah, I've been involved. Uh, I mean, I went to the flag march. I've gotten hit so many times by Arab, uh, gotten attacked, gotten assaulted. But you know that doesn't drain me. That doesn't put me down. Um, I believe you know I, I'm in, I'm involved. I, I'm technically involved in advocacy for for the right of settlement, technically the right of every Jew to build settlements of you know to build houses to have their right to be in Eretz Israel. That's this is, this is Jewish land. It belongs to Jews. And that's it, period. So, um, so yeah. And I've been, you know, in integrating in integrating into Israeli society. You know, I wouldn't say it, there, there was any process of integration. Just like it happened. Go with the flow. Like, I fit more with Israeli society, with Israeli mentality, more than I fit with anywhere else. You know? it, it feels, it just feels like, naturally feels like home. It's not na naturally like nothing, you know, people, people are so sweet and nice in Israel, you know, Everyone stops me in the street, you know, give me a hug, give me a, let, let's take a selfie together, you know, some people stop me for brachot, you know, I'm, I'm, have, you, have you ever, if you've heard of the Rabbi Shlomo Yehuda Biri, the Yanuka, um, he's a, he's a very big tzaddik, uh, he's 34 years, years old, uh, knows the entire Shas by heart, um, he's very famous in Israel, he's my personal Rav in Israel right now, uh, my Rav in America is Rabbi Avram Reich, but in Israel, you know, my postic is the Yanuka. So, so I'm very also close with the Yanuka. From the TV interviews and all the media attention you got. No, no, no. The, the Yanuka, the Yanuka doesn't um, doesn't watch any TV. Doesn't um, doesn't people. What I'm saying, do people stop you on the streets that recognize you? Oh yeah, yeah. Everyone, everyone. Actually, actually, someone stopped me during the Yamim Noraim, and he said, "Oh, uh, Yom Kippur is coming is coming soon. Please just forgive me, and you know, if I ever thought bad of you or something like that, and just give me a bracha." You know, every I've, I've taken so many selfies with people in Israel. It's it's insane. I have not had one single incident in Israel in which I was rejected or in which I was, 
you know, uh, neglected or anything. People are extremely loving and supportive and warm and friendly. It's insane. It's insane in, in comparison with Brooklyn. Let me turn um, to Rabbi. Uh, in Brooklyn, you're getting a lot of where in Brooklyn, you're getting a lot of uh, hate or you're getting a lot of I'm not, I'm not I, I wouldn't say I'm getting a lot of hate, like even from the Syrian community itself. Like I, I've not I have not seen any rejection or hate. I told you it's one rabbi that it's that that has been involved on top of this. And, you know, he's not even Syrian, Yemeni. But even in even in Israel, I I get invited. I eat by Syrian family. I daven in in the Syrian shul in Nakhlaot. Uh, the Syrian the rabbi in in the Syrian shul he told me, Elia, anything you need, anything you want, just come to me. Whatever you want, you know, you're welcome. Um, every everybody I hang out is Syrians from Mexico and Panama and uh, you know, my kahila, my kahila. Wonderful. My Let kahila. me turn to Rabbi Iraq before we break. <laughs> Here's an email question from Tuni. This rabbi is spreading false information about the Syrian community. Did he do his research? A ger is allowed to daven in a Syrian minion. They can't get an aliyah to a safe in Torah. Don't spread false information on the radio. The rule that was put in the place was done by great rabbanu of the Syrian community. It's despicable to hear you both questioning and belittling our rabbanu. Keep to your Ashkenazic laws and belittle and question your own rabbis. Well, uh, <clears throat> uh, the only thing I can say is, I mean, this gentleman himself says that he can't get an aliyah. <laughs> so he's he's spilling the beans himself. A, a, a ger comes in and you don't want to give him aliyah? That's terrible. That's that's degrading. <clears throat> and the fact is, and Zev, if you want to have the names of the kehilot in Mexico uh, that do not allow a ger, the main uh, to uh, as uh, Davin, <clears throat> And they're Mavayish and Barabim, unfortunately, to get out. Uh, but I can tell you, give you the names. So uh, the gentleman himself says he can't get an aliyah. So who's, uh, that, that somebody, he himself gets, he's saying that a ger, a convert, cannot get an aliyah. Get yeah, so, 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 what, what, so yeah, yeah, he spilled the beans himself, this guy. <laughs> can't All get right. an aliyah. <laughs> Rabbi Avramak is speaking. He's been guarding Aliyah Hawila, our guest, the Lebanese Hasan. And we'll continue our conversation. We'll look at some other interesting aspects right after these messages. So don't go away. Stay. You're listening to Talk Line with Zev Brenner, America's premier Jewish broadcast on the air since 1981. And now, here's your host. Welcome back to the program. I'm Zev Brenner, our guest, Leah Hawila. He is the Lebanese cousin, his rabbi. Rabbi Avram Reich joins us as well. He's an expert in dealing with conversions and also people returning to Judaism based in Brooklyn, New York. Ali, I know you had some comments before we get to some more of our questions from our audience. Ali, are you there? Can you hear me? Yes, Dev. Yes, I'm here. Yeah, I think you said there was a couple of points you wanted to make before we get to some of the questions from our audience. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm just, uh, you know, in, in, re in regards to like the process of giving a get, I just wanted to clarify because, you know, I feel like the articles were very misleading. I mean, two sets of articles throughout my whole story that were misleading. Number one, um, when I first got to Israel, um, by articles published by Koliv and um, <clears throat> Times of Israel said Il Ilya Hawila arrived to Israel to convert, which is completely false, completely not true. I already cleared everything out and uh, cleared everything out in America and did a, I did a gear al Khumra just to be on the safe side, as he said. Then when I got to Israel, it was just um, to move in, you know, to make Aliyah and uh, be there for Pesach. So whatever Koliv and Times of Israel published back then was just uh, hocus pocus. Um, and, but for now, the set of articles that said that my ex-wife's family filed a paper to the Rabbanut, and they were not involved at all with the Rabbanut and the rulings of the rabbis. Their only role was just to sit there and tell my wife and tell her, if you if you get back with him, we're going to disown you. We, you know, don't be with him and stuff like that. And the timeline of the get, I was not with, you know, completely false. I gave the get within a week. I asked the rabbi, I even, I told the rabbi, um, when, when, the, when the lawyer from Yad Lachayot was telling me to give her the get, uh, on the spot on that day, I told the rabbi, I said, you know, the Dayan, I said, if, if every if every person gave his wife a get within a week from the, you know, within within a day or two from their from them having a fight, no one would stay married in Am Israel. Everybody would be divorced. So the, the Dayan was like, okay, you're right. It took us a week and I tried to work things out. And um, within a week she had her get. You know, 
I'm not I'm not a get refuser or anything, but you know, <clears throat> I would per se I would like to also say that, you know, um, you know, even though I gave a get and I gave it willingly and I gave it, you know, but it, it part of it still feels like I was I was a bit forced to it, you know, forced into I wouldn't be I wouldn't say forced into giving the get, but forced into into the uh, into the situation, considering the timeline, considering the fact that we were going to move in together at the end of December, and all of a sudden I find myself out locked in Israel, and I find myself being you know you know threatened with things and stuff like that. So it wasn't very comfortable, but I said to myself, I need you know I need you know I need to let it out and give it out. People were if, you know and. In the community here in Brooklyn, people in the past were forced to give, you know, forced to give gets, but that doesn't apply to me. You know, whatever problem uh, was there with get refusers, that doesn't apply to me at all. Here's, but, here's an email question for you. How is it possible that Leah never knew that he had Jewish relatives too? Can Leah explain who was the last religious Jew in his family tree? How many generations back? And why did the first person who wasn't religious decide not to be religious? Okay, so how many generations back the religious Jew was? It goes back four generations. My great 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 grandmother, and she was from Aleppo, from Syria, from the Dweck. From the Dweck family, so that's yes. you trace it back. Okay, okay, and here's here's a question. I believe this is for Rabbi Rai. Uh, our listener, let me just see. Wants to know the question over here. Let me. This is we have quite a few. Like, how can one have questions and tinas? I mean, complaints on any community. For any minute, means any customer to kind of a ruling that they may have. Uh, uh, <clears throat> you have to clarify the question. I'm just reading it. I guess it wants to know is how can you question the the, the kind of the rules that any community may have to preserve their community? Well, uh, this is the greatness of the Jewish nation. There's a buy of a rubber. Ravina Rav Chizda, Yudlin Shmuel, that's, there's the Rajma and the Ritva. There are, there are through generations, we have different opinions. It's, uh, it's, it's just natural and normal uh, to uh, disagree, uh, even though I consider them a great community, practically every way, but um, it's my belief and the belief of most of the uh, rabbinical authorities in the world that it isn't fair to cut out a ger from a community when the Torah says well, I have to as a ger and there are and the, the Balatoma says it says 48 times in the Torah well I have to as a ger so if if uh, if the person is as um, if he feels that um, I'm not respectful to the, to the, uh, the Syrian community has to show them I have the greatest respect for them uh, they've done a, they've done a tremendous job of bringing up a new generation of Neitaira. I love them all, but you know, uh, one has nothing to do with the other. We have, I'm we're right, I'm sure after things. this progress, I'm not sure if you're going to get an Aliyah in a Syrian synagogue. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a question for Aliyah: Why would somebody like you, who has a Lebanese ethnic background and was left out because of his ethnicity, support Osma Yehuda Kahanis? Are you going to renounce your American citizenship if you make Aliyah? Also, do you still hold Lebanese citizenship as you still have a Lebanese passport? Um, he said support someone like who? Like the Kahanists? Yes, like, you know, like Osman Yehudis. I guess that you're a little Why, bit... you know, I mean, I mean, I've got, I'm, you know, I've gotten so much love and acceptance and friendliness from uh, people, people, people involved. That's my, they welcomed me. Uh, actually, Yom Hatzma'ut, the night before Yom Hatzma'ut, I went, I was, I was davening in uh, Yeshivat Rayon Yehudi. Uh, you know, Mikhail Ben-Ari was there, Itamar ben Gvir were there, they were giving me hugs and they were, we were having dinner together. There was a whole gathering. They don't hate me. They don't, you know, they, they see me as part of them. They see me, see me as part of the Jewish nation. You know, they're Jews, they're Yidin at the end of the day. Whether they're so, so super fully Zionist, super anti-Zionist, I think the question is, I think he said because you're Lebanese, and I guess they're considered to be anti-Arab. Is that why we? They're not. No, 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 not at all, not at all. Otsma Yehudit is not anti-Arab. Otsma Yehudit is just fighting for the rights of the Jews to, to to be to be to settle in the land of Israel. No, not at all. No, they're not anti-Arab. No, just the question that the Itamar Ben is not anti-Arab. No, this is Lashon Hara. This is unacceptable. No, no. 
Here's your Yehuda's rights. Fascinating program. Here's wishing that all parties involved should be well and have shalom and aslacha. It means the peace and luck and all that they do. Now that the saga is over and reflecting on the last year, many things were said and comments made by many people that weren't necessarily complimentary. Although we are joking of making a movie out of this story, we have people lies that we're dealing with. Please ask Aliyah Mechil of forgiveness from all of us who may have been guilty of this. We only wish you the best of the rest of your life. Keep up your positive attitude. Thank you. Say thank you. Um, that's, that's, that's I just, I just want, I want to, I want to point something out in regards to the, to the thing with Gairim and the Syrian community. Um, this is something people are not very familiar with, but specifically, specifically, the Syrian community in Panama does accept Gairim. They do just put them through more restrictive, you know, testing, testing stages and stuff like that. You know, this during our time right now, when we're living 2023. The, uh, the, the Syrian community in Panama accept Gayrim and the, to marry into the it's just something I wanted to put out. And, right. well, uh, this really, this Takana, this rule, from what I understand, was really one that was started by the Syrian community in Brooklyn and maybe other communities. Have it wasn't, it was started in Argentina and then adopted by Mexico. Yeah, by Brooklyn. Brooklyn. Okay, yes. I thought Brooklyn was the first one. Um, but. Yeah, but I mean, I mean, I, I mean. Even in Israel, you know, you walk into the Syrian shul in Nakhlaot and, you know, Gerim pray, you know, uh, they are very, very, they are very comfortably. I mean, even I saw one Ger in the Syrian shul in Nakhlaot get an aliyah. It's fascinating. But just in Brooklyn and in Mexico, for some reason, it's still, you know, it's still a taboo. You know, I would say it's, it's more of like politics. This is how I see it. That's just my opinion. It could not be that, but this is just no, how listen, I see it. From what I understand was, and there was, I think, some good motives behind the original Takana. Oh, definitely, 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 definitely. It was a different for, for, time, and I think you had Syrian men that were looking to marry out of the faith, and they wanted to nip that in the bud. They wanted to make sure. What I heard, what I heard is that it was very hard for Syrian men. You know, they, there were many restrictions and many requirements by rabbis that, Said that they, if you want me to be Mr. Der Kachin, you should have as much money or this or that. So men started marrying outside the community, marrying Goyot. So the huge influx of Goyot in the community, they had the Syrian rabbis had no choice. Rabbi Rabbi Maselton and Rabbi Kassin back then, what I heard, they said need to just ban. You know, it was needed. Takana was needed back then. I'm curious, Rabbi Reich, are you doing a lot of conversions? Are there a lot of people that's coming to you and said they want to convert to Judaism these days? As I mentioned before, um, I'm not a conversion rabbi. Uh, our Mao Bezdin, which we have, is not a conversion Bezdin. Uh, but the, the example of Elia Chavila is the type of work that we do. Uh, people come to us, and if we see they're sincere, we try to help them. Uh, we don't push them away. We try to help them. But we don't look for it. No, we don't search for it. We don't look for it. It's not part of our income and business. And, uh, and I'm not talking um, negative about rabbis that take money because the halakha is even though you're not supposed to take money for, uh, for conversion, uh, you're allowed to take schar batala, the time, you know, time consuming that you have to give for it. But um, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't know what to say uh, if I do a lot of them. But if you look at Elia Chavila, to me, he's considered, you know, the certain Jews that are uh, in Mitzrayim, they were, uh, 600,000 Jews born from one one from one woman. And the Gemara says, what do you mean 600,000? How is that possible? He says, when when uh, when Yechavit had Moshe Rabbeinu, he was considered chosh like the 600,000. So you see, every year every year that we have is has a different value. One year is 1,000 Mishamas, one is 100,000. I, I would think um, Elie, to me, is worth a half a million uh, Mishamot. So... <laughs> It's not the kamus, the amount, but uh, the fact that Baruch Hashem, I get, we get, um, we get telephones uh, very, very often during the week. People that are being rejected as as gerim, and um, if I may, uh, we have opened, we have uh, made a special bezdin. Uh, this is a, a leading poskim of our generation. This is Rabbi Shol David Harfinis, Machaber. Uh, uh, my, um, uh, 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 he's one of the great poskim of our generation. 
um, and uh, Peretz Steinberg, who's in the Bezin of the Igud Rabbonin, and uh, Rabbi Sheashel Kirsch, who's in the Bezin of Bishput Emis, that was the, Bishp, the, the Bezin of Rabbi Belsky and myself, which I'm a part of the Mishpat of, of um, Magli Tzedek Bezdin. We have decided because of all these problems that um, Geirim have, like for instance, a Geir that was in Zgair in Brooklyn goes, to, to, goes down to Florida. Uh, so the Florida Bezdin will not accept the Geiris if they don't know who the Bezdin was. And I can understand them, you know, I can understand them. What I don't understand is you should make your, you should do your, your homework and try to find out who the Bezdin is. What is the name of your bezin? Well, we, 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 uh, the, the purpose of our bezin is, is to, uh, if anybody, any gear that went through Geiris, um, we will certify it when we find out that this person is keeping Torah mitzvahs and the bezin that he uh, uh, was officiated by is a true bezin. Uh, if anybody wants to know about it, can call me or call Zev and uh, they'll give you my phone number to help with these type of gear. And unfortunately, there are many of them. We're, we're looking, uh, let me take one more question before we break. Okay, uh, here's, <laughs> I, I guess people are intrigued by the whole question about Osmet Yehudis and uh, that organization, which is part of the government. Question common to Lee, if you don't think that Kahanist and Osmet Yehudis are anti-Arab, then you clearly haven't researched them enough. Whether you like them or not, anti-Arabism is the whole part of Kahanism in Osmet Yehuda. Ben Gavir had a painting of Baruch Goldstein who killed six Arab children in a terror attack in his living room for years. Also, Leah, you didn't answer if you plan to renounce your US citizenship and if you still had a Lebanese passport. Well, you don't have to research uh, Otmar Yehudit, Otmar Ben Gvir to know if to, to know the truth. You just have to actually know them on a personal level and actually involve them that they're not bad people. Really, really good. Um, number two, my American citizenship. I am proud of my American citizenship. I am never ever renouncing my American citizenship. Citizenship. America is a country that protected Jews, that uh, gave Jews a safe haven when Jews were running away from Europe. You know, I am proud of my American citizenship, and I'm gonna still get my uh, my Israeli citizen citizenship soon. Bezrat Hashem. I'm applying for Aliyah. I'm in the process right now. Um, and uh, in regards to my Lebanese citizenship, it doesn't make any difference anyway. I'm Lebanese. I'm not Lebanese. <laughs> Israel doesn't reject me because I have a Lebanese passport. So I'm no, I don't. I don't have the... Any plans to go to Lebanon to see, to see any family or anything? Is that on the horizon? <laughs> Absolutely not. When we go back to Lebanon, Bezat Hashem will go back from the south on a tank to free Lebanon. <laughs> and give it, make, it, make it part of Eretz Israel. Our guest uh, is the Lebanese chassan, Aliyah Hawila, who has embraced... Uh, he actually, through the efforts of our other guest, Rabbi... Avram Reich has found his Jewish identity, even though he went through a conversion, which he didn't really have to go through, but he went through what's called conversion to Chumrah, and uh, he tried to reconcile with his wife. Didn't work out. Just recently gave her get a Jewish divorce. We're going to be right back right after these messages. Stay tuned. You're listening to Talk Line with Zev Brenner, America's premier Jewish broadcast on the air since 1981. And now, here's your host. Welcome back to the program. I'm Zev Brenner, our guest, Leah Hawila, the Lebanese Hassan. And he went through a whole ordeal where he masqueraded as a Jew and then discovered he was Jewish, but his wedding was, I guess, uh, dissolved. And then they were back together again. And now they're officially divorced. Rabbi Avram Reich is his rabbi who's been guiding him. Uh, is very popular shul and deals with people returning to Judaism. And he's also been involved in conversions. Um, Ali, you had a comment about Syrians and Gerim? Yeah, 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 it was it was the comment about uh, you know Panama um, regard regarding the Panama community primarily you know they're they're very open minded you know in regards you know very lenient in regards to the Kana. Um, but again, I mean it's a general rule. It's strictly applied in uh, you know in uh, in America and in Mexico specifically. I mean in Florida and Brooklyn. But you know, I mean. It, it's, it's you know the the Syrian community is not like the ghost that's just sitting there being uh, you know hit, hitting you know moving away people and trying to kick you know there there's still some people who are closed minded within the community all around the world but in general no you know I mean I'm I'm still I'm still part of this community the heart go, goes where it belongs you 
Turns out I'm actually a descendant, a descendant of the community. I come from the community, you know. I'm, I'm technically Syrian, you know. So I can't, I can't like speak bad, but like you know, whenever you see something bad, you know, you talk about it. So if 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 a, if a gear is not allowed to, to pray in a shul, no, that's wrong. That's I actually heard there's a shul in Florida with a uh, with Syrian shul with a sign on it that says "Gerim are not welcome here" or something like that. Um, I think it's I'm not sure if it's true or not, but if it's if it's true, then th th that's terrible. That's, that's that's very terrible. It shouldn't happen, you know. Um, yeah, but just. You know, let's not talk bad about each other. We're all Yidin at the end of the day. You know, whether we're born Jewish, whether we're Gayrim, we're all Yidin. You know, every every gear is, you know, welcome into this world, well, welcome into the Jewish world. The Torah says more, it, it, it repeats more and more times that uh, we should respect Gayrim than it says we should keep Shabbat. It this is the Torah. It's the Oraita. It doesn't come from me. It comes from the Torah. Absolutely. Now, where did you get your training from? Because obviously you're conversing, you know how to dive, you know how to learn. Where did you learn all of this? I mean, I started by myself in Lebanon. I taught myself how to read Hebrew. I read Tanakh. I taught myself Alaha. I went, I, when, I, when I came to America in the Bet Chabad in Texas, um, and I was even take a, you know, learning, watching Shirim and lectures online and Rabbi Yosef Mizrahi and Rabbi Yaron Rubin and... Uh, you know, when I came to America, you know, when I, sorry, when I came to Brooklyn, I went to Atera Torah. I was studying in Atera Torah during the time I was living here, you know, the Syrian yeshiva. Um, but in Israel, Israel, Bezrat Hashem, I'm planning on doing a yeshiva part-time right now. I'm not going to say which yeshiva, but uh, yeah, and I hope, I hope to get in touch with people back again right now and, you know, I, I, I haven't been so much in touch with people in Brooklyn, you know, people, people that I've known. Uh, and, you know, and people that I used to learn with, people, people that I used to schmooze with about learning. But I mean, number one, because I've been living in, living in Israel. Number two, right now, I have a serious issue. I lost my, my contacts. I lost my phone. I haven't, I'm sure people have been trying to contact me, but like, you know, I've lost people's numbers and I've lost people's emails. So just, uh, I, I don't have access to my email. So if anyone, you know, whoever's going to copy this, call leave Yeshiva World, please just mention to people, if they want to contact me, they should go back to Zev. And ask Zev for my number. You know, for my, I'm gonna give Zev my new number. So, so yeah, that's just we putting have that out. One, one, one or two more questions. Here's one. Uh, ask Ali, was he pressured or tricked into giving the get the Jewish divorce? Both. Both. I gave it. I gave it willingly. I gave it willingly. I gave it willingly. But both. Both. I was. The moment I gave the get um, in Israel, my ex-wife told me, you know, if you if you give me the get, you know, you'll uh, you know we'll work it out together. We'll uh, you know we'll be husband and wife again. You know, come to Brooklyn and work it out. It turns out no, she's just trying to get the get. She got in the end. Number two, you know, it, it, it's it's not a nice feeling. You know, you know when you're when you're pressured to stay in a country, when you're pressured and just squeezed, you, you feel like you feel like a prisoner. You're not allowed to leave the country just because you want to give a get. Okay. I what I told my ex-wife, I said, listen, you know, you want me to give you a get, just tell tell the Rabbanu to, to lift up the um, you know the order to prevent me to, to leave Israel. Let me come to Brooklyn. We'll try to work it out. If it works out, it works out. If it doesn't, I'll give you the get in the community, in our in our community, between our people. It doesn't have to get to that level where I have to be like choked down. I mean. But at the end, I said, you know what? It's not worth it anymore. I've been suffering for a year. And within a week, I gave the get. And then I come back to America and, you know, I find out that she's engaged. So Listen, there's man, that. It wasn't much. But as I said earlier, the fact that there was a deception in the original marriage, which turned out it wasn't a deception because of the facts that you were Jewish. Mm -hmm. But somehow that that also, I think, complicates for a relationship when the be ver the building blocks, there are some st blocks. A hundred percent, a hundred, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. I don't think, um, I don't think you've ever, both you ever ever overcame that completely. I understand a hundred, a hundred percent. But um, you know, this is coming from her directly. And by the way, you know, if anyone wants, you know, to know to get more information about this, I'd be happy. I'm gonna attach, you know, I'm gonna give Zev, you know, I'm gonna give you Zev a link that if people want to to get more details, I'm gonna have a Google Drive link for people to go get more information. And I'm even going to give the number of my marriage therapist. If anyone wants to contact her and ask her more details about this, you know, let let the people know. 
But um, my my wife, uh, you know, you know, my ex-wife told me, she said, I love you and I want you back and I forgive you. Um, and you can't keep keep going back and forth. It's not a game. It's, yeah, but you know, let's put that. You said she forgave, but there was a Yad Lachem video where she attacked you for for the sessions before. You know. Yes, where, and I said, "What's that about?" She said, "Oh, well, I needed the money to, you know, to help her with stuff. I'm not, I'm not gonna get into that." But she said, "I needed the money, and that excused her to make the video." You know, she made the video with Yad Lachim telling people, "Oh, you know, I want, uh, I don't want him anymore. He tricked me, blah blah blah, and I want, I want to continue my life." And at the same time, she was talking to me, like at the same time, she was texting me, telling me, I love you. I want to be with you. I want to get back together. You, you can't just go tell people this guy tricked me. I hate him. He's bad. Give me support and help. And at the same time, you know, go tell me, you know, you know, you know I want you and I love you. That doesn't work. This way. You can't you can't convince people that you hate me when you're talking to me behind their back. It's not we're right. Almost, we're almost out of time. Rabbi Abram Reich, any closing thoughts you'd like to share with our audience? Uh, there is one uh, trend of thought that uh, that people justify and turning away uh, non-Jews from becoming Gerim, and that is the halacha of Tchia. In Shulchan Aruch it says you have to push them away. <laughs> so that's taken out of text. It's taken out of text. Uh, Chazal teaches that the reason that before Mashiach will be dispersed, the Jewish nation will be dispersed over all the nations of the world is just the opposite to accept Gerim. And as I said, mentioned before, the Balotorim says it is 48 times in the Torah that you have to mention love a Ger or help a Ger. So when you ask a question, what does it mean when the, when the, uh, when, when the Lacha says you have to be doichim, you have to push him away? Pushing away means, very simple, you have to see whether he really wants it or not. You have to explain to him how hard it is. Until then, he had an easy life. He didn't have to watch what he was eating. He didn't have to watch who, who he was marrying. He didn't have Shabbos. He didn't have Yom Tif. You have to really go in to see whether this person really wants it, wants Judaism seriously with his whole heart. And the only way to do it is is to push the person away, not to tell them we don't want you, go away, which is terrible. And I, I want to tell you, I even heard Rabbanim say that, you know, that uh, what do you mean? Why do we have to help them? Of course we have to help them. It's Rabbanim Shalom that says we have to help them. And I always tell them, Avram Avinu, when was Hashem a car of Avram Avinu? Before he made the bris, before he became a yid. That teaches us that when you see somebody, just like Hashem saw that Avram Avinu wanted to be a Jew with his whole heart, we have to emulate Hashem. Mahu chanun afato chanun. Mahu rachum afato rachum. We also have to be makar of them. But the only way to be makar of them is to tell them, is to explain to them how hard it is to be a Jew and to see, even after we've given them uh, um, the, the, uh, the hardships, that it entails being a Jew, the person wants them. Of course, we have to embrace them. Brian, unfortunately, we're out of time, and, and I appreciate you really being here on the broadcast tonight. And uh, so, thank you. And I, I just, just, I just want everybody to know: please stop this attitude that we have to push you away, going from becoming gay. Stop that attitude. Know. It's not the Torah's attitude. Of course, we have to, like Rus did, like Rus did, uh, like Naomi did to Rus. She tries, she tried to explain to her three times. That's what we learned after three times. But after that, she was makar of her. The Mashiach comes from us. Thank you. Thank you. Before before ending, I just want to point something out. Um, going back to the original point, says that she is not engaged. I'm getting a bunch of emails, right? So I'm just putting that on for the record. She is. She is. And if someone wants to know, hit me up, and you'll know even the family that she's engaged. But just say we're closing. Let's just say we're done with playing games. We're we're done with playing games now. Put everything on the table. She is. She is engaged, and the guys from the community, and they're they're rushing them to get married. Actually, they want them to get married so fast. The family wants her to have a baby. Again, I'm getting emails otherwise. But Aliyah, we thank you for being on, and I guess you have your work. You have a great just, job. And, and um, I just wanted I just wanted to make one last point in regarding you know to the people who got agitated in regarding Bengzir. You know, 
till this day, Ben Gvir gets, you know, gets criticized that he's not Kahanist enough, just so you know. He's considered modern in uh, today's Israel terms. And uh, yeah, anyone who knows him on a personal level knows that he's one of, one of the yeah. sweetest yeah. people ever. Time, Ali Hawila, Lebanese husband. Thank you for being part of our show uh, tonight. Thank you so much.